Hello and welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. Welcome to one of the internet's best podcasts, where we dive deep into the lives of the extraordinary and fascinating people who leave an indelible mark on our world. Join us as we explore their captivating stories, remarkable achievements, and unique perspectives that shape history and inspire generations. Get ready to embark on a journey through the lives of inspiring people unlike any other. Ah, brand new. Ela Barr, my guest. What do you think of my intro? I think it's pretty snazzy. Snazzy, no, right? Right. To me. <laughs> I liked it too. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig show. Of course, my name is Avram Rosenzweig. And you know what? This is a show all about honoring people. I'm fascinated by individuals and their stories, their inspiring stories, uh, people who have the ability to articulate what they've gone through in life and what their visions are for their future and their family and their friends. Um, but I, I've really, really been thinking lately that we live in a world we're too hard on ourselves. We're tough on ourselves to the extent that we often castigate ourselves or one another. And I find there's nothing more beautiful in life where, whereby we can prop each other up, where we can look at each other's gifts, talents, the things that lie inside of us, those beautiful, beautiful things, and focus on them. I, I think that's a lovely, lovely thing. I literally try to do that as often as I can. So uh, very often, as an example, when I'm walking in my supermarket across the street, I will stop and I will speak to the people who are uh, placing cans on the shelves, and I'll get to know them a little bit. A woman told me recently that her son has ended up in jail. Um, she didn't tell me why. Apparently, that was just uh, something that was too private. And we started talking about it. And over the last few weeks, she told me firstly that, unfortunately, he was like beat up in jail. But eventually, some people sort of mentored him, and things came around. And she was so thankful that I had asked her about her son, about her family. And I said, you know what? You, you seem like you're a really, really caring mother. You seem like you're someone who deeply, deeply struggles with what is all about to be a good family member, to take care of your, your, your progenies, despite the fact that one of your sons is in jail, you're doing a, an incredible job. And she was very thankful for that. So that is what we are all about here on the Avram Rosenzweig show, inspiration and honoring. And today we are honoring a, br a brand new friend of mine. I've never met her before. This is actually the first time that we're schmoozing and her name is Ela Barr. How are you, Ela? I'm great. All the better for being on your show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm so happy that you're here. I saw you on the internet, and I'll say why in a second. And I thought, man, this this she would be a really good guest. So Ela is uh, she lives in Israel, made Aliyah when she was 23 years old from South Africa, and uh, you live in in a uh, currently in Srigim. Um, formerly in Ashkelon, Jerusalem, and Modim. Uh, Ela is a writer. Recently with some friends, colleagues, she want, launched a website called Iron Words Israel, and that is essentially giving people like myself in the diaspora, Israelis who are in the army, who are at home, who are working, the opportunity to write something about October 7th and afterwards and to submit it to this wonderful website. She's a poet, and I've read some of her poetry. I really enjoyed it. And like me, she is a purveyor of life. So once again, Ela Barr, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a real honor to be with you. Well, one so. of the things I should mention, too, is that you're, uh, you're a mother of six kids, right? Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> which is a full-time job. I have one boy, and I can barely handle that. <laughs> so I always tell people it's all relative. It really, I mean, it's, yeah, it's relative. One, two, three, four, ten. I'm in absolute awe of individuals who have even two children, but six. I have a sister, by the way, who has eight children. And um, she has managed it very, very well. Do you know where all your kids are at any given time? Not always. No, I mean, some of them are older and out the house and they have their own lives. Um, but even when they were younger, you know, the phone would ring 
someone would want to speak to one of the kids and I'd go looking for them. No, they're not home. Like I didn't even know they weren't home. You right, know, right. That kind of things. <laughs> That's kind of the culture in Israel though, isn't it? Like kids are feel more safe going off on their own than they would here in Canada, I'm sure. I think so. I think so. Yeah. I, think so. I, I once went to Banyas. Have you ever been at Banyas? I actually haven't. I haven't been oh, there. Oh, you have to go. It must you be very to. beautiful, yeah. It's stunningly gorgeous. And it's there's a waterfall there. And in order to get to the waterfall, you have to climb down this very long ramp and these sort of a flimsy ladder. Uh -huh. uh, and I remember kids running around of every age climbing down that ladder. And I was or said to one of my friends, like, the way you raise kids in Israel, like I said, is much different than in the diaspora. I think you allow them to live and play. There is a great sense of freedom, I notice, absolutely. Um, and a sense of safety. Yeah. Uh, despite everything, there is a general sense of safety and freedom overall. And I also notice, you know, even though uh, the, the, the technology, you know, has has also affected the kids here there is still a lot more outside playing and hobbies and and those kinds of activities um uh, you know I, I see that among kids my own children too i have some that that are like on their computers all the time in their phones and I have others that my daughter she crocheted a hat. I said, where did you learn to do this from? She said, right. YouTube. You're like, okay, she, she used YouTube to, to learn how to crochet, but she then she sat down and she did it. Um, you know, my my other daughters taught herself to play the guitar. You know, they, they sit and they they do things, and it's, it's great. Yeah. yeah, you must be very deeply proud of them. I am. Each one in his own way. Yeah, yeah. Would you say first and foremost you're a mom? Someone would ask you to identify yourself. Currently, that's right. Um, currently, no. Ten years ago, yes, for sure. But right now, um, not really, because each of my children are in a different place. Um, I only have one daughter living with me at home. And she's pretty independent, although she, you know, she needs me when she needs me. And I try to be there for her. But uh, to be honest, no. Uh, what am I? Uh, how would I define myself right now? Yeah, top, let's say top three That's things. It's a difficult question. Writer, or, you know, would certainly come into the, into the equation there. Mom is well, but I don't think I would define myself solely or or uh, primarily as a mother. You know, let me ask you something. I found, a, found in myself, since I'm a kid, that I have a deep fascination with words. Now, I come from a family of um, bibliophiles, people who love books. Right. My sister, Naomi, unfortunately, who passed away during COVID, yeah. she was a brilliant, brilliant writer. I have oh. a nephew who's a script writer. So it, it kind of seems like it's in the DNA how would you define your deep love of words? You know, it's funny. I think one of the poems I gave you is about words, where I said words is the lowest form of expression. <laughs> and yet it's... Yeah, it's, that's right. You did say uh, that. We can talk about that later. How would I define it? Uh, I think uh, I was also taught from a very, very young age, I was taught the love of reading and books. And I was reading at age three. I was already reading. Um, I still remember sitting with my mother she teach me the alphabet. She said she took it on herself to teach me how to read. And I was reading from a very young age. And they say that often, um, you know, the, the, the people's passions or, or, or what they turn out to be professionally when they're older is often connected to their hobbies and things that they did when they were younger. Yes. And the love of books stands out strongly for me. Um, I also have a, I could have studied music. Uh, I do have a bit of music in my background, but I neglected that a bit. And I guess uh, using words is probably, some people might argue with me, but it's probably the easiest way of expressing oneself. Um, again, 
I, that's not that there's no rule for that because everybody has strengths in different areas, but it's do you do, uh, do you do Ooh. funny things with words? Like as an example, I've been wor- spelling words or, uh, in my head backwards as far back as I can remember. So as an example, one of the supermarkets yeah. here near me is called Loblaws. Now Loblaws backwards is swall ball. Right. So whenever I drive by Loblaws, immediately in my head, I won't necessarily even say it's someone who's in the car. I'll say yeah. uh, I'll say swall balls and I'll laugh. I'll giggle. Do you do stuff with words in your head? I don't think I do. You, you I, have to try it. Look, look at words and see what they are backwards. It's fascinating. It is sometimes. You know, um, the name Efrat, my youngest, who's four years old, her, her second name is Efrat, and backwards it's Terape, to heal. She yes. will heal. So the Hebrew name. Uh, T- tell us what your six kids' names are. All right. Uh, my oldest is yes. Yishai. Uh, Yishai is 24 at the moment, and he works in uh, software programming. Mm. Uh, then we have Merav, who's studying nursing. Nice. We have Ariel, who is doing a, a post-school course, um, a vocational type of course. Um, then we have Tehila, which is similar to my name, Hila. Yes. <laughs> Tehila is in 11th grade. Ayelet is in 10th grade. And Ya'ara, I need to think anyone, what grade is she in? Ya'ara is in 8th grade. <laughs> how, how did you come up with the names? Uh, every, everyone's a different story. Um, I think their father came up with a lot of the names on his own. <laughs> Um, was that tough for you thinking, okay, I'm bringing this child into the world and this name will identify him or her throughout their entire lives. Was it a difficult process? It was, I mean, Ariel, my third one, um, uh, he had his, he had his, sorry, is your audience, is your audience, uh, everybody? He had his circumcision. Okay. Yeah. If you can translate. Yeah. Translate as much as you can. Yeah. Okay, he had his circumcision late due to medical reasons. Uh, and for a long time, we didn't have a name for him. He, he was nameless it's because we just couldn't think of a name. Yeah. And uh, for a long time, we didn't know what we were going to do. And lucky we had enough time <laughs> to think about uh-huh. it. But was it a, it was, um, can't remember that far back. Um, have they lived up to their names, do you find? Yeshai, yes. Yeshai means the gift of God. Gift of God. He is very special. Very, How very so? Special. How is he and special? I, they all are. Yeshai is on the autistic spectrum, but he's very high functioning, and he's just got a very, very special heart. He's extremely sensitive. He's brilliant. Yes. Very, very bright. Um, and while well, everybody in his university course was struggling with you know, with the work, he was he was acing it, and he was giving everybody tutorials and lessons. And he's he's, he's very bright. Uh, he's just he's just he's just such a gentle soul. He's 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 he's, he's lovely. Merav, I mean, I can make up on the spot. I can make connections to the personalities with their names right now. Merav means uh, like to to multiply a lot, and she she is. Uh, she has a lot of love to give. She's very giving. She has a lot of, uh, she's full of life. She's, she has a lot to give. Does she sure. hug you a lot or do you hug her? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, when I see, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, uh, are, you just, are you huggy? Are you a huggy mom? I try, but you know, my children don't always want to hug me back. Right, but, right. uh, one thing, I mean, rough, um, one thing about most of my children, um, even if I embarrass them, <laughs> they don't try to run away from me or like separate themselves or pretend that they're, you know, not together with me. Uh, they're very, they, 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 they accept me. They, they, you know, they'll embrace who I am, even if it's embarrassing for them. I'll perform in front of their friends and they'll just say like, <laughs> you know, they won't. 
get upset and ask me to stop. And I'll just say, well, but, but it's uh, it's okay. They're, they're pretty accepting of me. Um, how did we go? Oh, because yeah, you spoke about hugging. Um, for some of my kids, you know, they all have different personalities. Some, yes. some, hu some hug less, some accept me less. Some, you know, don't want to be with me uh, more. You know, they more don't want to be with me when I'm being silly. But, uh, but um, I think that's a function of parenting. Yeah, it's yeah. my job. Tell me, it's, it's my job. Oh. <laughs> I mean, how often do I hear yeah. from my, right, it's your job. How often do I hear from my son, daddy, please don't do that. Or we're about to walk into a place and I'd love talking to strangers, which you do as well. And, uh, and he'll say, daddy, before we go in there, you have to promise me, you're not going to talk to everybody. I said, okay, honey, you know, I love doing that, but I'll do that for you. Right. I don't know if I will do that for my kids. Um, <laughs> I don't always, I mean, I don't make a point of talking to everybody. I also depends on my mood. Sometimes I'm feeling a bit shy or sometimes I'm just yes. not in the mood. But other times I will say something. And you know what? I'm sure you find this too. Uh, like you were talking to the, the woman whose son was in jail. Um, I'm sure you find often they really appreciate it and they're so glad you said something. The children, um, the children are glad you're saying. No, no, no. Sorry, the people you speak to. Oh, absolutely, hundred. Which is why sometimes I say to my kids, sometimes you know, I'm sorry that you feel this way, but I want to do this, and I'm going to do this because this is what I'd like to do. Yeah, of course, I sometimes do respect or, you know, abide by what they want. I don't want to drive them crazy every time, and I don't want to. Um, uh, not acknowledge them always, but I also have a life and um, I can, uh, you know, do what feels right to me. I hear you. I think it's a balancing act. I yeah. think there are, there are times where I'll, you're right. Like you, I'll say to my son, no, I'll go, no, honey, I'm going to do this because that's what I do. That's who I am. And then there are other times I'll see he's out of sorts. So I'll say, fine. I will just concentrate on you. Yeah. Now, one of the things I really enjoyed, I, I, I try to do as much studying on my guests as possible, a little research. Yeah. And one of the things that I really liked about your writings and about you was your interaction and your perception of uh, people whom you don't know. Like I said before, strangers. You wrote this marvelous piece, which is called Sala. S A L A H. Oh, right. Now, yeah. let, 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 let me set this up, okay? You, okay. Um, you're a mother of six. You work really, really yeah. hard. You're a translator, hence your response, by the way, to my uh, interview with Hillel Hulkin, who also is right. world, world renowned uh, translator. And you write poetry and you write about your perceptions of life. So, around 2019, for a couple of years, you needed to make ends meet. So you worked at a really a local, local supermarket, right? Yeah. In the cheese section. That's a story how I got there. And yeah, I worked in the cheese section. I was a cheese expert after a while. I knew all about the different cheeses. <laughs> what, what's yeah. your favorite, what's your favorite cheese? Oh, just regular standard yellow cheese. Actually. <laughs> I don't, I don't really, I'm not much of a cheese person, but I just, I did get to taste them. If you have to ask me about any cheese names, I've already forgotten. Uh, honestly, it's uh, it's been a while. 2019, yeah, but <laughs> but, uh, but you know what I really you know what I really liked about this story. Not only Sala, which we're going to read in a second. Okay. But you did what you needed to do. You know. It was you, not. You easy. did what you needed to do. You know. Most of us, or not most of us, but I assume you and myself and many other people that we mix with don't come from that kind of uh, background, let's say. Um, it was, you go to university and you study to be something, a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, architect. And this is not the kind of work that I'm used to people around me or in my circles doing. Um, I had no choice. I, I had to do something and I didn't know what to do with myself. And, um, yeah, I, it was not easy, but I had to do it and I did it. 
Did you come to enjoy it working in the supermarket? I enjoyed it. And all the customers were friends of mine and people I knew from the community. Yeah. <laughs> and so we had little, uh, we had little, you know, meetups by the cheese counter. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. there were about three or four of us hanging around. <laughs> chatting. Eating the cheese. Um, occasionally. Okay, you know, usually, we, can't, yeah. we can't use up too much cheese there. <laughs> the manager won't be happy, but, but, but yeah. Um, so that, that was kind of fun. I enjoyed it because it exposed me to other kinds of people. There were, um, yeah, um, different cultures, different ways of living. There were Arabs from the West Bank. Um, there were Israeli Arabs from, uh, from Ramla uh, and Lod. There were, which are cities which are mixed Jewish and Arab in Israel. Um, there were Jewish people too, religious, not religious. Um, I still remember the one time there was a religious, one of the religious employees with a black skull cap, kippah, and did he have a beard? I don't know. He might, I, some, I think sometimes he had a beard, sometimes he didn't. And I just remember him talking to one of the, you know, one of one of the Arab employees, and he said, uh, "It's talking to him." He said, "Hi, how are you, brother?" You know, it, it it was just so nice to hear because everybody, no matter who they were, we were all like a, a family. That might sound like a cliche, but uh, people were pretty close, and it, it was really nice. There were differences you know, of culture for me, but and sometimes it was frustrating, and uh, but it was it was a pretty warm family on the whole. What what would have been frustrating about it? Um, sometimes, and I found it was mostly with with the Arab people, um, and I assume it has to do with the culture, where it's. I imagine most cultures are very patriarchal. However, um, the more you know. Many of us have become westernized and we're more used to some level of equality, some measure. Um, and they would sometimes boss me around and talk a little bit down to me, which I didn't like. Yeah. And I would have a lot of altercations uh, with some of them um, at times. Other times I just took it. It didn't really, you know, it, I guess it also depended on my mood and on a lot of other factors, but, but, but there was that. Um, Isn't Israeli society, by and large, patriarchal? Not where I come from. Not where, I, not where I'm from. Uh, you might find it in the Arab sector and the ultra-Orthodox sector more. Um, I must be honest. I, I'm not. I'm not. I personally am. I'm not all for men and women being completely equal. I want a man to be a man and a woman to be a woman, and I want a man to protect me and look after me. You know, I can't do that. I want somebody to, you know. But so I'm not. Um, I don't have that mindset in in terms of uh, equality. I mean, maybe that's not a good choice of word. I'm not sure it uh, is because you're saying that there are rules, right? I think so. I, I, I think there are rules. Um, it's it's very complicated. I, I can't, yes, you know, I, I would have to formulate my thoughts and start thinking. It's it's not so cut and dry. No, it's fine. Um, but but I certainly believe there is place. That I, I, I think men and women are different and... Uh, um, we each have a bit of, you know, the masculine and the feminine within us. Obviously, men have more of the masculine, women have more of the feminine, and we have to embrace that and 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 portray that and show that because that's who we are. Are you tough when you need to be? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can be a bitch. Most of the time, I'm not. Um, <laughs> I think some people would be surprised to hear me say that. Um, but I can be tough. Um, I run my own little business. Um, I've learned, and I'm still learning to be tough with clients and with um, 
anybody else. I don't, I don't know who else do I work with. Sometimes right, my suppliers. Right. Um, I can be tough. Uh, on the whole, I think sometimes I'm not tough enough. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of us can say that. Now, you yeah. came from South Africa, yeah. and uh, a friend of mine told me years ago that within every South African, there's a little bit of Zulu, a little bit of warrior. Does that resonate with you at all? I never thought of it that way. Do you see um, yourself as a warrior at all? I don't see myself as a warrior. I see myself as an African. I love the the concept of being African um the culture it's so colorful and yes. beautiful yes. and the landscape and and the people i love it that i'm a part of that that i come from that um that i grew up there um it's magnificent there i don't care what's happening now in south africa it's got nothing to do with you know um i love the place cry my um, beloved country right that kind of thing yeah yeah. yeah. Do you dress <laughs> uh, in do you dress in flamboyant or colorful uh, clothing? Not really. I will I'll, I will take something bright to break the the drab. Yeah. Um, and I do like wearing certain intense colors, but not flamboyant and not million of patterns and things like. I don't like patterns and and, and things like that really. No, I wouldn't say I dress African style. <laughs> Not at all. Most people don't. Most people are Western there. You know, most people are yes. very Westernized. Yes. Uh, you still have your tribes and here and there, and sometimes the Africans dress in their traditional dress. Listen, I haven't lived there for 20, since 1996. A long time. And I've been back, uh, the last time I was there was 10 years ago. Yeah. So, well, there uh, you go. I, yeah. So, but, uh, so I'm, what I'm talking, I'm talking about from when I used to live there. Um, uh, you still get some of the traditional dress, uh, but uh, it's just, it's just very special. It's very, very special. The music and the culture and, and uh, within South Africa, there's so many uh, branches of culture. I mean, I'm from Cape Town and Cape Town have the, the Cape colored culture, yes. which isn't found in elsewhere in South Africa. So, uh, you know, that's uh, something You definitely else. smile when you talk about South Africa. Who hunted me to you? That's all I say in Afrikaans. That's all you say from my audience, South African friends in Canada. <laughs> you know, um, um, Cry the Beloved Country, you mentioned, I just want to tell you, it's the title of a book by a well-known South African author, Alan Payton. Yeah. I actually studied it in university. Uh, I read it two or three times Um and yeah, it's a basically a uh, lamenting of the 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 state of the country. It was written long ago, and I'm not going to elaborate because I'd have to read it again to explain what it's about. Because my head is so full of everything, yes. but uh, yeah. I don't retain everything. Ela Bar yes. is my guest today, yes. and Ela is an Israeli, made Aliyah when she's 23 years old. I am delighted to have her. She's a poet. She's a writer. Ela, you wrote an art, uh, uh, basically an essay about Salah. Salah is a young Arab man that you worked with at the supermarket. Yeah. Would you mind if I read it? Yeah, this wasn't at the supermarket, actually. I worked for a year at the supermarket. And to be honest, um, I couldn't handle it there anymore because it was a different culture and a different demographic that was working there. It, I, it, was, it was getting difficult. And I switched to work in a coffee shop. So Salah the was coffee actually, shop. Uh, yeah, so he was one of the employees at the coffee shop. Did you mind if I read it? Of course, go ahead. I noticed him sitting at the corner table by the entrance. He wasn't like the rest. You can feel people sometimes, and he felt different. I walked over to him and began talking. His smile felt like delicate velvet caressing my body. His name was Salah. And as I guessed, he was going to be working with us. He was beautifully and refer refreshingly distinct. His Hebrew was different, barely an accent. The way he spoke could most certainly pass for Jews in my books. I guessed he was about 20 or 22 years old, and there was something about the way he looked, too. It wasn't physical. It was something deeper that radiated through his face. 
Once he began work, he caught on quickly. He was confident and sensible. It was the small things, opening boxes by pulling the tape off the back so as not to tear off the label in the front. I, I love these little nuances. Arranging the dispatch area to enable more efficient activity. Washing dishes with close attention to where food particles may be hiding. I watch as the others joked and fooled around between themselves, excluding Sala. From my standpoint, I'd see him leaning back against the counter, observing them, his mouth softening into a very gentle smile. So when I discovered that he was 16 years old, I was taken aback, yet not surprised. Sala was a pleasure to work with. Conversation flowed easily. He was mature, sensitive, considerate, and he was a very hard worker. One day when I arrived at work and we saw we'd been working in a team on tasks that morning, he flattered me by saying, it's great working with you. You keep me sane. <laughs> <laughs> One day he revealed two things to me. People from Abu Ghosh are very insular. They're not that open to accepting people from other communities. They feel they're superior. Quote, you should hear what they say about the others from Ain Nakabu, Nakuba. Nakuba. Yeah. Nakuba. He also told me that he goes to a dual medium school in Jerusalem. That's probably why his Hebrew is so good. His, his English isn't bad either, for that matter. S are both your parents from Abu Ghosh, I asked? Well, his mother is from Abu Ghosh, but his father is from elsewhere. I had an inkling. They live, they live in Abu Ghosh. His parents' way of thinking is a bit more progressive, of which a marriage between an insider and an outsider may present a fair indicator, I suppose. All in all, he was cause for reflection. A family, a person who is prepared to venture beyond the scope of the familiar and the familiar, one who is open and willing to accept those who are different, has so much more to gain. They become enlightened and endearing. It begins on a small scale. Let others slice tomatoes the way they like. Hand dry or drip dry their dishes. That's great. I love this. Read the books they enjoy. Work in a vacation of their choosing. Often an offer of unsolicited advice is a cover for insecurity. Very rarely is it genuine and heartfelt. To discern from where it stems demands a high degree of self-awareness and humility. Therefore, I assert that when we are ready and willing to let go of our differences, to draw barriers of fear for ourselves and our communities, and this is not a reckless call of ideology, but rather an insight into humanity, one which many of us are not yet ready to appreciate, we will experience a shift, both individually and collectively, that will raise our level of consciousness. Sulla's maturity and insight at age 16, the light and the warmth I felt beaming through him, was to me the sense of a higher level of being, only he likely was born at. A breakthrough from a former stage of perception, an affirmation of a journey that we are all capable of, a vision of our own potential, and that is hardly the beginning. It was my time with Sala which gave rise to a short post of mine from 5th of August, 2021. Did, did he ever read this? Did he know about this? He never read this. He didn't know about this. I also, yeah. Um yeah, nice, it, nice, beautiful, Ela. He was a, he was a very. He's still working there, I think. I pop in sometimes. He's still there. He was, yeah. He was unusual, very, very special. And um, no, he doesn't know I wrote about that. I uh, well, wrote about him. Do you have any I, mystic, mystical thoughts on this piece being written about a Sala, a man out there, a young man out there, and he knows nothing, nothing about it. I've written about other people too. I've uh, encounters with other people, strangers sometimes. Yeah. Um, they don't know. In fact, my neighbor, um, I wrote a piece about her. Um, it's in the Times of Israel blog. I'm going to show it to her one day. She doesn't know yet. Um, I'm going you think to, she'll uh, be okay with it? Yeah, she'll be fine. She'll be fine. It's nothing, yeah. Mm. Ila? It's not as deep as the one with Salah. It was just, it was, it was, a, it's a different article. But, but yeah, sorry, Avram. Where were you yes. October 7th? I was home. I was sleeping. You know, uh, the sirens went off at about 
6.30 in the morning, I think. So it was a Saturday morning. I was home with my daughter. We were fast asleep. And suddenly the siren woke me up. Hmm. It was surreal because usually, uh, I think I think many people have mentioned this, usually we're, we know it's about to happen and we're waiting. We get, you know, there's uh, intelligence or there's something happening and we're aware. This came as a complete surprise and it was just so odd. And I thought, what is happening? I don't know what's happening. There must be something. Let's run to the safe room. Now, I live in, uh, I live on top of, I live in a double story, in a building. I live on top of my landlord's house. Let's just say that on the top floor. So uh, I don't have a safe room in my place. The safe room is downstairs with my landlord, my neighbors. So the neighbor I wrote about is a different neighbor. Um, I didn't even walk, you know, I wanted to walk into my daughter's room and wake her up respectfully, but I was so taken aback by the siren. I just started yelling to her, wake up, get up, get up, wake up from outside of her room. I didn't like, it was, I was almost out of control. Eventually she got up. I said, let's go. We got to go downstairs. We ran downstairs. We got into the safe room. This is all in English. You speak in English in the house? I speak to her in English. I speak to my children in English, all of them, except for the third one. We speak half English, half Hebrew. Okay. Um, because he was, uh, okay, that's another story. Um, we came downstairs to our neighbors. We got into the safe room and their whole family was there as well. Now this was Shabbat, the Sabbath. Um, and my neighbor's family, uh, some are religious and some aren't. So we were closed up in the safe room. And some of them were busy praying their, their, their Shabbat prayers with their, with their shawl, their ta ta talit around their, their shawls and busy praying with their, with their prayer books. Yeah. And uh, others were, one of them happened to be, my, my neighbor's niece is a journalist, um, a fairly well-known journalist here in Israel. They're Hebrew speakers. So she was busy on the phone reporting into to the newsroom and, you know, talking to them there. And half the people were you know, religious and praying, another half were with their phones and playing around in their phones and messaging people. And it was just, it was just, as I said before, surreal. Um, the siren where I am, it's not a very densely populated area. It's not a big city. So we had about two sirens that morning. That's all. So each time the siren went, we ran to the safe room. And other than that, it was just, I don't, I don't observe the Sabbath, so I did open, you know, my the computer and look online, see what was going on, and I saw that I read what was happening, and it was inconceivable. It was, you know, I, I went into denial, like, how can this be happening? What on earth is going on? Uh, and when people, people were in shock, when people say, you know, it's um, I don't know what else to say to you. The whole day, the whole community here where I live, uh, we were just in, uh, in South Africa, you say in a dwell. We were just spaced out. We, because it, it was just something that, um, we couldn't conceive that something like this truly happened. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I was basically home with my daughter. Um, it was crazy. Where are you geographically in Israel? I am... Let's say between Jerusalem and Beersheba. Um, I don't know if your viewers know Beit Shemesh. Mm -hmm. uh, Beit Shemesh is about half an hour from Jerusalem. It's it's a little bit south of Beit Shemesh. I can say between Jerusalem and Beersheba, but closer to Jerusalem. Were you scared? No, no. I you weren't. I don't think so. I, I don't I don't get afraid with these things. A lot of people are get scared. I've I've never been one to be very afraid. 
Um, I usually take a step back. That's where I get my poetry, my writing from. I usually step out of the circle of activity mm -hmm. and I peer inwards. And that's, I think that's where I've been most of the time, looking around me and seeing what's going on. And although I have been a part of it in terms of volunteering and sometimes writing, uh, my writing was more a result of also the my personal challenges I've been going through. So it wasn't uh, only that. I didn't write much, actually, about the war. I go through periods where I'm very busy and taken up by life, and I don't write as much. And other times when I have more time to contemplate, that's when I write. So I didn't write much. One of my poems is about... Uh, on the beach in Roshan de Tzion. Shortly after the war broke out, um, I went with one of my daughters to the beach. Um, I was a little bit apprehensive, but I had had enough and I just wanted to get out. And we went to the beach one evening and it was empty. Uh, usually there's, there's people walking around, taking walks, having picnics. It mm -hmm. was dark at night already. And they were the odd, was the odd person or couple walking around. It was extreme, it was ghostly, extremely mm -hmm. quiet. So my poem was more about the, the quietness, the silence on the beach uh, as a result of people being afraid to come rather than the actual fear and the war. And of course the siren went while we were on the beach. Um, Where did you go? Um, we went back off the sand. There's a whole line of, there's a whole commercial strip um, along the beach. So we went back uh, to that strip and found a little nook where we went in and we just sat there. It was big enough for a few people and there were other people around who also uh, went and just took shelter there. But on, I mean, chances are you're not going to be hit. And that's why I'm not afraid. You drive on the road every day. There's more of a chance having a car accident. Sorry, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little bit brash. There's more of a chance getting killed in a car accident than being hit by shrap shrapnel or, or, or a rocket. Mm -hmm. It does happen and it has happened and people have been killed. Mm -hmm. But the chances are very, very slim because Israel has gone to such um, efforts to to protect us to protect their citizens yeah you, you know you know what i really appreciate uh in you is your uh, your ability to stand back as you said before almost like a tourist who looking through their camera on a vacation <clears throat> you can be objective about what you're seeing uh your perceptions of things and with that comes an ability to see how so many israelis probably the vast majority of Israelis are involved in uh, unity, are involved in some project or program that's helping other people. And you wrote a beautiful piece about it in your blog, in uh, The Heroes of Swords of Iron. That's what you called oh, it. Yeah. I, I just absolutely adored it. Can I read this piece too? Of course. You know, Daniel and I yell it, by the way. When I, when I, I, write, I write about Daniel and I yell it. One right. Daniel's my ex-husband and Ayelet is one of my daughters. So Okay, good. <laughs> anyway, so one of the reasons on. I really I like reading your stuff, two reasons. Number one is I really enjoy reading. And number, I was always the kid in school, Ila, who's oh, yeah, I'll yeah. read, <laughs> you know, pain in the ass I was. And the other thing that I like <laughs> is that you have this enormous smile on your face when I read your stuff. And you have such a beautiful smile. Uh, so Thank I'm going to I'm going to read this piece here. It's called okay. Heroes of Swords of Iron. Imagine a man or a woman standing head and shoulders above the rest. They have worked hard and raised themselves up the ladder of life. They have established beneficial connections, a sterling reputation, and earned widespread standing. They deserve to be head and shoulders above the rest. Now imagine this man being held up by three or four people with those people being held up by a few more. Do you get the picture? Right at the bottom, there may be dozens of people holding up a whole pyramid of people, all of whom do excellent work. But if one of those people on the ground let go, 
the arrangement becomes somewhat lopsided, diminish its function slightly so that it works less effectively, per not, perhaps not as quickly. A week or two ago, an artist had an idea for a project and was looking for suggestions of people who are currently doing a lot of good in Israel. The responses were tired, repetitive, unoriginal. They were names of people we hear of time and time again. I was rather disappointed. I would have thought to suggest individuals on the ground who are giving of themselves. Not that the man at the top does not work on the ground. He certainly does. But for once, let us celebrate the tireless people who give up with their hearts in the small places. Those who are working without pay for the greater good to keep this country together. There are many exceptional individuals without whom a precious part of this country would be solely lacking. To Karen, Avi, Danny, Udi, and so many others who stand guard throughout the day and night, ensuring the safety of my community. To Hanan, who supplies free coffee to the security team. To Chevy, who single-handedly organized the purchase of army supplies in the U.S. To Yishai, who stood packing vegetables after harvest. To Ilana, who organized a group purchase of flowers and plants from the South. To Ayelet and Daniel, Dan Daniel, who stood making sandwiches for soldiers. To Roni, who provides free physiotherapy to evacuees. To Ila, not me, who has, not, who has been packing supplies for army bases. To Einat, who has donated items to evacuees. To Aviram, who is in charge of evacuees in one of the nearby communities. And the list goes on and on. At this time, so many people have been and still are giving of their time and their hearts to drive and deliver, to host evacuees, to foster pets, to hold activities for children and adults, to offer counseling, to cook, to move furniture for evacuees, to provide company for the elderly who live alone, to fill in as supermarket workers and hospital cleaners, to offer legal assistance, to serve on their city's citizen uh, patrol, to offer free services in the myriad fields of their work, massage, music, art, education, and countless more, to be a listener, listening ear to their friends, to write and spread Hasbara, to attend funerals and shiva houses, to boost our morale with banners, flags, and stickers. To the mothers and fathers who stay home taking care of their children, uh, to those for whom they most, uh, sorry, to those for whom the most they can do is get up in the morning and perhaps flash a smile in an effort to make the world that much brighter. You are doing your best, and that is all counts. I applaud you all. You are the heroes who keep our country going. Wow, who wrote that? How beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Is it, yeah, a nice to, is it a nice to hear your own piece? It's nice, it, no? It is. It is. Um, that's the thing with, with giving. Um, we don't have to donate millions of dollars. We don't have to open a soup kitchen if we can't. It's not the only thing that we need to do, we can do. You know, we like I wrote at the end, a simple smile costs nothing. It sometimes means yeah. a lot or yeah. a word or a good morning, you know, or anything. That's part of giving. And uh, we can all do that. You seem to smile more at the mention of some than others. You actually laughed at the mention of one of them. Um, yes. Which one did I laugh at? It was a boisterous laugh. Um, I can't remember which one I laughed at. It's um, when I turned the page. So hang on a second. Okay. Karen, <laughs> Avi, Danny, Udi. What are those? those? That's who I laughed at? Those are my neighbors. Those are people I know from from, from my community here where okay. I live. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I'd forgotten that I'd mentioned them. I think that's why. <laughs> now, would they have seen this? No. No, yeah, they're, mean, all, you, they're, they're Hebrew speakers. I don't, I don't, I don't, um, uh, yeah, I mean, not, Dafka, Abby's not a Hebrew speaker. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, he grew up here. Um, I, no, I don't uh, start sending my, I don't know, I just, I don't. The only that. reason I would tell you to do it, if it's not for yeah. yourself, although yeah. you really should, you know, advertise yourself a lot, I think, because you write beautifully, but, 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 uh, give these people honor, let them feel good about themselves. Okay. 
Just a okay. thought. Now, October 7th happens, and yeah. subsequently, um, the Israelis have to respond, and people have to come together. There was a book written recently by a fellow, and his name uh, does not come to mind. It's called The Genius of Israel. And people think the genius of Israel is the startups, the brilliance mm -hmm. of you know launching a project and it taking off worldwide, creating products and so on. He said, no. He said the genius of Israel is the achdut. It's the ability to come together in the most difficult times. I, I think so. It's it's incredible because there are there's so many differences that people fight about, and suddenly everybody just like threw it out the window. Yeah, you know we're you know we're together on this. We're a team. <clears throat> we're a we're, we're a community. We're a people. We're 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 together. We're united. We're doing this together. And it was it's it was. I don't, I don't have the words for it. You see, I don't always have the words because I say words is not is is, is it, there's far more higher ways to express oneself than words, um, but it it was just it. It was beautiful. It was yeah. Do do you find that you're uh, more involved in uh, unifying projects, things that bring people together, than before? So, or is that just your nature to begin with? Um. Hmm. Uh, okay, first of all, what I want to say before I answer your question. Now, I think the unity that, that the people in this country have achieved is not going to continue. I think it's the level that we can reach. And things are already settling down because people have to return to work and to school and people aren't as, uh, they, you know, they still need help because the war's still going on, but people also have to return to their regular lives. Um, and uh, just, uh, But apart from that, it's, 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 it's an emotional and a psychological level that, that can't be maintained. Correct, it's, I agree. It, it needs to be worked at still, and we are going to sink a little lower in the future, I believe, but it, it is attainable. Uh, and you asked me about now, sorry, I, that was a side note. Uh, I have about community projects. Um, I'll be very honest. Um, I don't take part in many community projects. I usually, when I help and give people, I just, I do it on my own. Um, mainly, I think, because I am exhausted. I, I'm really find myself busy trying to earn a living seeing to my children um and taking care of myself you're tired uh, yeah i don't take part too much in community efforts i did a little bit during the war no in fact you know when i helped during the war it was also on my own i mean somebody needed a driver so i volunteered but i wasn't part of some convict some some organization or you know let's meet uh every day at 10 o'clock and pack food for the soldiers it wasn't like that i didn't help out like that in that way i usually um it's just the way i am i help out in my own individual way um and i think uh it's just i don't feel i feel different from most people i don't feel like i don't think it's the right not that i don't feel like i don't belong i just don't feel like i'm part of uh the majority of you know the mainstream mm -hmm. um so that's why i often take a step back um and watch the other people and i just feel like i'm different um do you, do you find times where you can get rest yeah yeah i do i do um uh yeah I, I'm okay. I do need a holiday right now. I've been dealing with a lot, and I feel like I need a holiday. And where would you go? Where would you go on holiday? I think I would go to South Africa. No. I have parents there, and just to just to get a little bit spoiled, maybe. Um. Yeah. Uh, I I also want to mention Ela. Yeah. Yeah. That. Uh, 
so I don't have this sense from what I've discovered about you that you're off on your own at all. I mean, you know, at some point after October 7th, you decided to come together with some of your friends yeah. and create uh, Iron Word Israel. And yeah. I was thinking about the title. I was thinking, okay, so they're sitting together having a coffee or maybe an Iraq. And they're saying, what the hell should we call this thing? And maybe Iron Dome popped into your head and you figure Iron Dome, Iron right. Word. Am I right? Uh I'll, I'll explain what happened. Um, we, I came up, we came up with the idea independently of each other. Um, I can tell from my side, because I am me, <laughs> I uh, was feeling helpless. A few days after the war broke out, I was feeling like I need to do something. I need to feel yeah. useful. I need to do, what can I do? How can I contribute? Um, and thought, you know what? It's not going to feed the soldiers. It's not going to keep them warm. But it is certainly a very, very significant aspect of life, uh, creativity and culture and expression. It's very important to express oneself. And that's where I am. That's, you know, that's where one of my strengths lie. And I thought, let's do this. Let's ask for submissions. I was also being very sensitive to the fact that there's a lot of people out there that write or create some other form of art and don't get recognized because they're just don't uh they don't um what is the word they don't share it they don't advertise it they're shy they're just not good enough whatever the reason is they just haven't had those opportunities um i'm going to offer the writing opportunity to anyone who would like to and i wanted to actually make a book but the cost of a book is was not you know i didn't have the funds for that so I ended up, I thought of a website, but that was also a big headache for me and I just didn't have the time. Uh, so I just collected a whole lot of submissions and I made it into a PDF document and I distributed it and it was, a lot of people appreciated it. And those who, who, who wrote in and submitted their writing, uh, I think were, were very happy. Uh, and then someone approaches me saying, I know you're, you know, you're, you're involved with poetry, war poetry and war writing. Someone else wanted to know about, is there a website about poetry? Uh, and that's how, that's how we got together, uh, myself and two others. Um, we got together. My, the, the original name of my project was Pens and Swords. As in, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword, but it's uh, uh, swords of iron. Uh, one of the, so there were three of us. We, we got together. Um, I'd already sent out this PDF, the, in, the initial writings. We sat together and they didn't, one of them didn't like pens and swords. She was pretty sensitive to anything that, that hinted at violence and she didn't like the word sword. And so we came up with iron words, Israel. Um, it took a lot of uh, WhatsApping back and forth <laughs> to decide on a name, even yeah. after our meeting. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, thereafter, a fourth person joined us. Um, let me just say their names. Uh, I am together with Sarah Pritzker. Yes. The third person who was with us left the group, and she'd rather not be named. Um, and the fourth person who joined us, and now we're still three, uh, her name is Yael Maoz, and she owns a publishing company. She also had the idea of collecting writing and making a book, she told me, um, and she had been distracted by something else, so she hadn't come around, gone around to doing anything about it. And when she heard what we were doing, she was interested to join. So what she, we have our website. What she ultimately wants to do is to compile a book. Yes. Well, it might be good if somebody's listening. And they yeah. would like to contribute toward the publishing Absolutely. of that book. So uh, I'll just I'll just give the web the website is yeah. simply ironwordsisrael.com. If anybody would like to submit, read, you're most welcome. Uh, ironwordsisrael.com. Now, if yes. you don't mind, once again, um, really, if you if if you do, I'm still going to read it. I want to read a piece that I found on your website. Okay. Is that okay? With pleasure. Now it's divided up into groups. People who are on the front have written some pieces. Those who are at home, those who are at work, those who are in school. Uh, mm -hmm. Diaspora Jews can write. In fact, I wrote down in my scheduler before our interview, submit a piece 
to Ila's uh, website on Friday. So I'm going to try to do that. Oh, that would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So this is by Maytal Dayan, and it was submitted on February 12th, 2024. Uh, this is writings, what she says, from the war front, and it's called Across the Yard. Mm. It goes like this. Where the stukas, where the sukkah still stood, we could hear the beat to the drums of war as we danced and rejoiced with the Holy Torah. I warily turned the lock of the door. A missile blast set the sky aglow. With such a roar, I as yet did not know, early worshipers rushing home like angels wrapped in white as they bring their prayers to an end while a myriad souls in pain and fear to heaven begin to ascend. The burning smell is much more than fire. It is tinged with the scent of blood. The safe room is steeped in a fear unknown, and the heart begins to thud. A Jewish light in the murderous dark bows its head in submission. Please, O oh God, how long will the wicked rejoice upon your nation? So I gather my things, and I leave with my children to a place so far from home, far from the fish tank, and far from the lemon tree, far from the breach of my tranquility, swords of iron, I hear your metal call to order, your battle to protect our land and border. And when the cries of war slowly part, I'll return to my land, my home, my heart. Yeah, my towel, Diane, that is, that was a very beautiful poem in Hebrew. <laughs> um, yeah. You translate, um, did you translate it? I translated it. Um, I got her name from a friend of mine. A friend of mine knows her, contacted me. Metal's written a poem. Do you think you can translate it for her? The pleasure. Um, I translated it, and then I asked Metal permission. She has two poems that I've translated on the site there. I asked permission for both, you know, to post both poems on the website, which she agreed to. And she is a resident of the town of Sterot. In Israel, we call it a city of Sterot. It's not a city. It's not that. It's it's a town. <laughs> uh, she's from Sterot, which is very, very close to the Gaza border, and it's always the target of rocket attacks. Mm -hmm. So all those people had to evacuate their homes and move elsewhere during the war. You, you have a strong feeling for her, don't you? Natal? Uh her poetry was very nice. It's very real. It's very yeah. Um, yeah. honest. Yeah. Uh, I don't know her well. But uh, then it was, you know, it was when I mentioned her poetry that she had written it, you became very soft. Your response. Probably because I translated it, that's why. <laughs> when it's my translate. work. You know? <laughs> but, um, but, but yes, but, but both her poems that she submitted <laughs> right. were very, um, just, just very down to earth, very human, very unpretentious. Just Can I read one more piece? Of course. This is uh, not shocking, but it kind of threw me a little bit. Uh, it's by Maxim D. Schreier. Maxim is a professor of English and Russian literature in New York, I think. Uh, yeah, he submitted some poetry. Yeah. L listen to this piece, folks. The poets of Hamas bemoan the death of one of their own. Villanez and sonnets deny that men from Gaza so violated. Uh, is this Maxim or his daughter Tatiana? I think I think it's Maxine. Uh, apologies. Uh, would you like to start over? I yeah, to... yeah. No, that's okay. Okay. Um, it's for Frank Salome. He says. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The poems of Hamas bemoan the death of one of their own. V Villanez and sonnets deny that men from Gaza violated Jewish girls time and time again in gangs with rabid zeal. They call it Zionist lies and smokescreens, bloody rhymes with bloody Jewish bodies, terzarima of mutilated babies, cut off breasts, heroic couplets, slender Gazan stanzas, by learned men who died to murder Jews. In Boston and in London, poets mourn their fellow rhymesters, how they guzzled down their martyred verse on X and Instagram, their gazels of ecstasy and the rubble, humsat of their chivalrous exploits into Israeli farmlands 
Kasayid to mark the glorious advent of Intifada, Merathi, where Israel, Israel always rhymes with death. In London and in Boston, poets spread this hatred. Wow. That is heavy for me. <laughs> Oh, it's a, yeah. like it's anathema of the wolf from of what expects from poetry. It's sh it's like shocking. Yeah. For, yeah. Right. Is it hard to be an Israeli nowadays? Not in Israel. Not in I Israel. Don't know about outside of Israel. <laughs> you think it might be hard in South Africa when you go back for your vacation to get spoiled. <laughs> I don't think so. I'll tell you why. Even when I was living there, we first of all, uh, even when I was living there, the the let's just say the Muslim element was pretty um, pretty rough. Uh, I remember being afraid then and being careful then. You don't put a sticker yeah. with the Israeli flag on your car, or you you don't be careful if you want to wear walk around with a yarmulke on your head. Um, in certain areas. Uh, so even then, the, the, it was pretty scary. Uh, from what I recall, I don't, you know. However, the vast majority of South Africans, I would imagine, I don't know for sure. I don't follow politics too much. I don't follow the news usually. Um, um, most people are supportive of Jews there. Most people there understand uh, that, feel that their government has erred. Uh, they don't agree with the government. There's a lot of politics there, a lot of corruption. I don't think, but this is not an educated answer. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't even know what to say, but I, I don't feel afraid to go there. Um, Do you have any idea why we're hated so much? We're very successful. We're very successful. But listen, sometimes Jews are their own worst enemies. Some, sometimes Jews uh, bring it on themselves. Um, you know, they'll they'll nitpick. They'll find everything to 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 create a big performance about. And I don't like that. But um, I think there's a lot of jealousy. We're we're a successful people. Um, we, have a lot of pride and we voice that pride. A lot of the time Jews like to refer to themselves as the chosen people. And I think that's misused. I don't like that when people carry on, we're the chosen people, we're the chosen people, because that I think also uh arouses jealousy and hatred um i think chosen people means something else uh one of it being to show you know to 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 be good role models uh and by behaving like that i don't believe that's a good role model but yeah i think i think well that is a deep question um, it's a deep podcast yeah yeah uh we are Fear, fear and jealousy. Fear, I mean, hundreds of years ago, Jews were unable to uh, to have, there were many professions that they weren't allowed to be. Uh, so they were left handling all the money. Who doesn't want money, you know? <laughs> so. I do. There's a lot of, uh, um, and uh, they were left to study in the yeshivas. So they developed their intellect. They became wealthy. Um, I imagine that would arouse a bit of jealousy too. I, I, I mean, I would have to think about this more. I'm not a scholar in this area, but. Okay. Can uh, I ask yeah. you, can I ask you five questions? Yes or no answers? Yeah. Do you study Torah? No. Have you ever? Yes. What's your favorite color? Green. Green? Mm. 
Do you know why? I don't know why. Do you have green clothes? I have some green clothes. Um, perhaps because it's a symbol of life, green grass, green foliage. Um, but I'm not always in the mood to, I mean, I usually dress or when, if I have to choose a color, even my mug of coffee in the morning, I actually consider what color mug I'd like to drink out of. Uh, it's almost like an intuitive feeling. What color do I need to drink from today or what? clothes what color do i feel like wearing today so i don't always feel like wearing green um but uh green green nescafe or drip coffee ah uh, nescafe uh, i always uh, i always find it amusing that when i met my ex-husband he wasn't a coffee drinker and i was and I taught him to enjoy coffee. And now he's the coffee fundi, and I'm still drinking my, <laughs> my instant coffee. <laughs> so, favorite yeah. food, favorite food, Ela Bar. Oh, gosh. Okay, well, my favorite fruit is a plum. It's always been a plum. Favorite a plum. food, anything, anything spicy, hot. Um, I, I, don't have, I, got, like, not, I don't have any one dish that's my favorite. Okay. But uh, yeah. like, uh, like, Good hearty soup or a stew or, or, or something like a curry that, that's hot. I like that. Can you say daughter like a Canadian, not a South African? The word daughter. <laughs> Try that. Daughter. My no, daughter. It's not daughter. No. It's daughter. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Can you say? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Try my South African. Go All ahead. All right. Well, what, what can you say? Uh, can, can you say? Uh, it's a lovely day. Go, uh, that, go park what... the car. Go, go park the car. Go park the car. No, that's Boston. Go park the car. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's now, a, listen, uh, Ela Bar. We have some visitors. Yes. We have some visitors coming your way. I expect you to be hospitable. Uh, there's a congregation here in Toronto called Habonim. My dear friend Ellie. Um, is the uh, senior spiritual leader. He's a magnificent storyteller. And if you want to hear some great storytelling, go to one of my podcasts or two. And we're, okay. you'll, he knows 2,000 stories in his head. 2,000 stories. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful mind. Anyways, his shul is sponsoring a solidarity mission to Israel on May 10th to the 15th. All right. um, join Habonim clergy and members as we travel to Israel to bear witness, learn, and support the Jewish state on a six-day mission. Meaningful volunteer opportunities. Visit the Nova Festival site, Kibbutzim, and towns affected by October 7th massacre. Hear from the IDF soldiers. Engage with, engage with activists, spokespeople, and thought leaders. Um, meet and support hostages who have been returned and families of hostages and other victims. First ever congregation Habonim trip to Israel. Be a part of this historic solidarity mission. And again, that's May 10th to the 15th. And if you would like more information, please feel free to be in touch with me. Uh, it's reasonably priced at around 2,900 US plus flight. And I think you're going to have a very special time. What do you think of those missions, Ela Bar? I've never been asked that before. I think they're important. I think I think they're important um, just for the sake of creating uh, relationships with communities outside of Israel. Um, I just think any form of connection is important and um, it is a good way to visit the country um, and learn about what's what's going on here. I and when you see that... when you see diaspora Jews walking down your street, yeah, or if you're in Jerusalem, what what occurs to you? It's like way to go, thanks for coming, or why are you here? I've heard I've heard diaspora Jews who made Aliyah, and mm -hmm. and Israelis will say to them, why, why did you come here? Yes, I've also been asked that. Um, um, you, that's a, you know, not, I mean, we can't generalize. You get the type of Israeli that would ask such a question. No, it's, it's not, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it, not everybody would ask such a thing. Uh, if I see a diaspora, you know what I would really, you know, okay. 
you're rich American Jew. <laughs> you come here every summer. <laughs> you know, that's what I, 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 I that's what you know? think, right? That's what you think. Um, yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm no, it's okay. Know, I, I'm going to be me. I'm going to be me. Oh, I appreciate your honesty. Thank you so much. Enjoy your holiday. Enjoy your stay. Enjoy your <laughs> yeah, five-star yeah. hotel. I don't know. You know this isn't the Wait, real Eli, show. Eli, are you still considered an Ola by some? An immigrant? I think I'm still considered an Ola. I mean, I think I've been here so long until I meet uh, some old lady. Oh, I've been here for 65 years. You know, I've been here for 28 years. Um, so I, I'm still an Ola. I'm a veteran Ola. They call them. Uh, so I'm not. A, I'm not. I'm not considered new Ola. I probably don't have any uh, rights as an Ola anymore. Um, no, I mean perceptions of others. That's what oh, I mean. um, Yes. Yes. I, yes, I, I am. I speak with an accent. My mentality, I would say it's somewhere between a diaspora Jew and a, you know, true Israeli. Um, too Israeli to be, an, you know, I'm too rough to be a diaspora Jew, but I'm too refined to be a real Israeli. So uh, I'm somewhere in between there. But they're, they're still there. They're, I do uh, portray like some, uh, like a, uh, my character is fairly refined to be, and yet you get Israelis like that too. So I'm generalizing. Okay. You get, you know, you, we have the typical Israeli who people think are rough and rude and and everything else, but it honestly depends who you mix with. And I have encountered very, very, you know, refined, uh, well-mannered, considerate, sensitive Israelis. Yes. Just like anyone. Do you so, sing at all? Yeah, um, I do. I sang in two choirs when I was a student. My father um, used to conduct our synagogue choir. Oh, and nice. thereafter, he would act as the chazan. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, I, I don't sing. Like currently, I don't really have much opportunity to sing. Uh my voice isn't developed. Like I don't have, I never went to voice development lessons or anything like that, but I like to sing. I have a bit w of a voice. Would you, would you sing us a song to conclude the show? <laughs> oh, what shall I sing? I, I, I don't know. Kola Olam Kulo Gesher Tzarma Od. You know what? I'd rather not, if, if, if that's okay. <laughs> I mean, it'd be so exciting, Hila. No? Uh, <laughs> um... I'd rather not. I'm not. Maybe next make next make interview. a lot of it. I'll practice something next podcast, and I will. I will, boss. I will, I will. sing a song. Ela, is there any concluding words that you have for us? Um. About Israel, perhaps. I think Israel must be the safest place on earth right now. That's what I have to say. People may be afraid to come, but it's. The media tends to uh, blow any news item out of proportion, so we never really get the right idea of what's going on. And not just because of the heightened security we have here, but come to Israel. We all go to work, we go to school, we're driving on the roads, we're doing our shopping, we're living life as normal. Yeah, there are people who have lost loved ones. There are plenty of soldiers still fighting for their lives in the north and in the south. Uh, there are plenty of families that have been affected in many ways, evacuees and so on. But the vast majority of us are living a life as normal, but with the added awareness that there are there is a war happening and we need to be aware and alert. So uh, we're just living life as best we can. I'm Yisrael Chai. I'm Yisrael I, really Chai. I really enjoyed our interview. Did you? I loved it. And there's so much more I have to say. We didn't, no, but you know, hold we on. didn't, really, hold, hold we didn't on. touch. Why and did you enjoy it? What did you enjoy about it? I'm not fishing. I'm really curious. Why did I enjoy it? I liked, you brought out subjects that are close to my heart, South Africa, my children, my writing. Obviously, I mean, that's, you know, I, I would imagine that's uh, that's the logical, sensible, normal thing to do. But 
I enjoyed it because I spoke about things that I enjoy. Okay. Basically, it, it, it lifted my spirits. And um, there's a lot I didn't talk about. I also managed to explain myself a little bit. A lot of people, I feel a lot of people don't know me very well um, when I spoke about being on the periphery and looking inwards and not feeling a part of the, you know, the main, you know, the matrix, uh, but, uh, um, so I, I enjoyed it yeah. because you are painfully honest and I a lot of, I don't know I'll, how to be anything else. Yeah. You're really yeah. honest. So a lot of times, you know, I will interview people. There was one fellow I interviewed, lovely human being, does amazing Ooh. things in Israel, but he spoke to me in some ways as if I was a Jewish organization. He said the right things. And right. I, I, I don't think when you were going through the machinations in your head, in terms of answers to my questions, you were thinking, what would be a good thing to answer right now? It was more, what, what are you feeling? What are you sensing? I have to be honest. I have to be honest. Uh, it doesn't always come across. Now, this isn't a professional podcast for, you know, in a professional setting as such. I'm not giving, I'm not giving a consultation or teaching yes. people something, but so, so it's, 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 um, and what I'm saying is it doesn't always come across as very professional or proper when I speak, but proper, proper, proper in terms <laughs> try, try of saying- the proper thing is to be honest, surely, you know, uh, that's just the way I, I can't, I yes. can't imagine saying anything else. No, I, you were great. And stop what? calling me Shirley. <laughs> okay. So Ela Bar, I want everybody who's interested in my show to go avramrosenswag.com or you can go to my YouTube channel. It's called the Avram Rosenzweig Show. And do me a favor, subscribe, <clears throat> because there's huge advantages to me when you subscribe. So if you like the show, Ela, if you like the show, show it to your friends, you know, uh, spread it far and wide. And I would very, very much be appreciate if people would become members, would subscribe. All Absolutely. you have to do is click on a button. That's, 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 and, sorry, go on. That's all you need to do. Um, and what I want to do, what were you going to say? I'd love to come again. <laughs> oh, you want to be a, a guest again? Okay, very cool. We will Sometime do that. Sometime in the future when you're ready. You wear green. You'll have a special mug, right? I wear green. Okay. And I want to conclude the show um, with a poem from Elabar. Uh, and Elabar, this, I don't know. You sent me five poems. You didn't name any of them. So I named this one. It's called Just Like a Cat. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't name my poems. I usually don't. I have a whole compilation of poems to be published. So I decided that I needed to give each one a title, but I just don't give my poems titles. I may, just, may I suggest that you start? Okay. Why do you suggest that? Uh, because I like I'm here? thinking, how, how am I going to uh, announce this poem here? And uh, my cat died last week, by the way, Lily. I'm so L sorry to lose a yeah. pet is, 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 Heartbreaking. I know. Painful. There was like an it's emptiness here at my house. What? It's quite painful. Have you lost a pet? Yeah. What did we, you lose? Uh, you know, we have a lot of street cats that wander around the streets in I Israel. Know. In Israel. So yeah. uh, they often like to wander around. We, we never chase them away. So they come in and they make themselves at home on our beds and in our house. And I even yeah. buy cat food now. But one of them uh, we sort of adopted. We we knew him for about two years and did you name him ago, or like your we poetry? Named him Ivan. My daughter named him Ivan. Yeah. Ivan. Ivan. All right. So here's your poem. <laughs> and then after that, we are going to leave you. And I want to thank everyone for viewing and watching and listening. It's been splendid. I so enjoyed this interview. Thank you, Ila Bar. I really appreciated thank it. You. Thank you. Ivan. It goes like this. Just you're welcome. Just like a cat. The floor is cool beneath my legs, and the hum of the fridge breaks the quiet that has set in the room like a mantra and I watch two cats stare back at me as they lie sprawled opposite soaking in the coolness while the sun dips lower bringing late afternoon shadows that sway gently across the floor in sync with the branches outside and the end of day birdsong begins to rise from the heaviness of the day and I watch the cats and they watch me and I wonder what they wonder about me because I think I know now what it's like to be on the cool, cool floor at the end of the day amid the sounds and shadows and the soothing light without even checking the phone, just like a cat. Meow.
Thank you, Ila Bar. <laughs> Bye. Everyone, thank you. Bye. It was an honor to be here. Thank you so honor much for inviting you. me. Don't be like my grandmother where you don't know how to say goodbye. You know, did you have Bye. a booby? Did you have a booby like that? So I goes in. I'll see you next week. I'll bring you over a sandwich. And they just didn't know how to say goodbye. My mother was like that too. I don't. You know what? I, I don't even know. I don't remember. <laughs> okay, we're ending on that. Bye, Ila. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.